Hello, I am Eddie O'Sullivan, and this is This Week in the Italian Campaign. Week in the Italian Campaign, brought to you by the Freedom for Italy Network, the Irish Brigade on Monte Castellone and Phantom Ridge, and in Cairo on the 28th of March to the 28th of April 1944, with my special guest, Richard O'Sullivan. Following the third attempt to capture Casino and the Monte Casino Massif in March 1944, Allied formations across the Italian front line were rearranged. 78 Infantry Division, which had been moved from the Adriatic Front to join the New Zealand Corps in February, had been returned to the command of General Oliver Lisi's 8th Army. It had replaced New Zealand Division formations along the Gari and in Casino itself. The division's 11th Brigade had already moved up to the banks of the river opposite San Angelo in Theodice to join the 3rd Battle of Casino. On the 22nd of March, one Royal Irish Fusiliers known as the Fogs and two London Irish Rifles, both of 38th Irish Brigade, replaced 11th Brigade along the Gari. Six Royal Inner Skilling Fusiliers known as the Skins were held in reserve. The brigade was taken out of the front line five days later, and it returned temporarily to the Mignano area. Orders were then received that it was to relieve formations of the French Expeditionary Corps in and around Cairo. The whole area was under German observation and targeted shelling. Irish Brigade Commander Pat Scott, Fox Commander James Daniel, and the brigade's liaison officer John O'Rourke set off by jeep for Cairo to meet General Montsabert, commander of the 3rd Algerian Infantry Division, Scott recorded the report of their terrifying journey across the Ribido Valley. Everything was quite peaceful going through the villages of San Michele and Portela, but even so, they viewed with a considerable amount of misgiving the notices which read, shell trap, no halting, which were placed at intervals along the road. On leaving Portela, they descended into the Rapido Valley. The speed of the two jeeps down the Mad Mile, well named, broke all records. They turned off right through Villa, but met a warm reception from the Bosch gunners going along this stretch. On arrival, all military matters were suspended for the ritual of déjeuner. This lasted for nearly two hours. There were seven courses and adequate liquid refreshments. The orchestra was not lacking either. It was provided by shells of all sizes arriving about. After dark on the 28th of March, the skins moved from San Michele as silently as possible across the valley, across the Ripido, and passed through Cara up to Monte Castellone to frontline positions on Phantom Ridge, overlooking the Abbey. After dark on the 30th of March, the London Irish occupied Castelloni, while the fogs went to Cara and the southern slopes of Monte Cara the following night. London Irish Rifles Colour Sergeant Ted O'Sullivan described the night his company moved to Monte Castelloni in his post-war memoir, All My Brothers. I was taken with my supplies to San Michele, and here I was allocated about 30 mules, which I loaded with tools, food and water, and some of the men's kit. Following immediately behind the company in picture darkness, we climbed down the hill. From there, we continued towards the town of Casino and crossed the Rapido by a stone bridge. When we were in the middle, a salvo of shells landed on the road. At this point, we had difficulty controlling the mules and the drivers. We set off again, slowly following the overladen soldiers, after getting so close to Monte Cassino that we felt we were almost under the monastery's walls, we started climbing a precipitous path to Monte Castellone. I finally arrived at the top with about half a dozen mules. Loads were spread along the track behind us. The whole thing was a tactical mistake. The companies should have moved in first, and the mule trains followed after they had settled. E Company's position was the summit of Monte Castellone, and like the Monastery Hill, it was really a foothill of Monte Cara. It was located on a salient behind Monte Cassino that had been taken by French and American troops at tremendous cost. Slit trenches could not be dug in the rock, so sangers were built from the vast amount of rubble. The place stank. 
Holes could not be excavated and excrement was thrown everywhere. Each sanger had a large food tin as a latrine. I had to leave as dawn was breaking. If I was not back in the village of Kara, where the battalion headquarters was before sunrise, I would have to walk across the wide valley in full daylight. I made my way from there back to the mule point at San Michele in a jeep. As soon as I arrived, I had to start preparing for the next trip. On a phantom ridge in Castellone, movement in daylight attracted German fire and was effectively impossible. The skins closest to German positions carried out aggressive and regular night patrols to establish local dominance. The skins on Phantom Ridge were closest to the Abbey. Lieutenant John Wilton, an Oxford University student when he was called up in 1941, crawled out one night to check two sentries in a forward post. He was accompanied by a Lance Corporal, a rugged regular soldier from Ireland. When we got a little nearer to these two, we heard snoring. The Corporal crawled on behind these chaps, took his bayonet out of his scabbard, and laid it against one of them. I'll cut your bloody throat for you. He left the two of them back to back, keeping each other awake by trembling, and we didn't have any more problems of that sort. In this period, Irish Brigade Catholic Padre Dan Kelleher from Kerry in Ireland was awarded the Military Cross for bravery. His citation said, Heavy shelling was reported in Kara village, causing several casualties. The Reverend Kelleher immediately raced to the village, which was under very heavy shelling. He found the wounded men and assisted the stripped bearers in their work, carrying wounded in his arms at great personal risk to the shelter of a ruined building. His cheerfulness and practical assistance undoubtedly saved the lives of two men and gave fresh proof of his unfailing devotion to duty. Plans were meanwhile being finalized for Operation Diadem, a massive assault against the Gustav line, time to destroy German formations and force others to be sent to Italy ahead of the invasion of Northwest Europe. Irish Brigade Commander Pat Scott was asked to develop a plan to capture the Abbey as part of Diadem. In his post-war account of the story of the Irish Brigade, Scott noted, I said, I thought the best plan was for someone else to capture it. At the end of April, the Irish Brigade was relieved by two Polish corps, which had been allocated the role of capturing Monte Cassino. It was withdrawn to near former Cola for four days rest, followed by intensive training in river crossings and working with the Sherman tanks of the 16th 5th Lancers. There were visits to 78 Division Leave Camp near Amalfi. Everyone had the opportunity for six days leave there, or at Ravello or Maori. An ENSA company was based in Capua's Garrison Theatre. There were visits to Capri, Pompeii and Naples. Some Irish Brigade members went to a leave camp in Bari on the Adriatic coast. The sun was now shining and the roads were drying, allowing armour, artillery and the supplies needed by Diadem to be brought up. In London, UK Prime Minister Winston Churchill sent a telegram to President Roosevelt. At latest by 14th of May, we will attack and push in everything as hard as possible. On the 5th of April, Royal Irish Fusiliers Captain Lawrence Franklin Vale wrote to his wife, Olive in the UK, from his position close to Cairo. One night, some little time ago, three of us listened to the nine o'clock BBC News in a small ruined hut. The announcer was speaking of the bitter fighting at Casino. Outside, there was the tremendous roar and thunder of our guns, and the darkness was punctured with flashes of light as tracer bullets winged their way. And through the roar of artillery, came the rat-tap-tap of British and German machine guns and the sound of explosions. I listened to the news and thought of you sitting quietly at home with Valerie probably sleeping 
It seems strange indeed that the same voice was probably speaking to both of us and how different were our surroundings. Out here, it seemed a grim and terrible night with death on every hand. I thought it would be very nice sitting at home with you by a comfortable fire. Heaps of love to you and Valerie, my own, the dearest, most precious of wives. All my love and kisses, Lawrence. Well, I'm now joined by my uh, brother and co-producer uh, of the uh, All My Brothers film series, uh, Richard O'Sullivan. Happy Easter so, to everyone. Yeah, happy Easter, Richard. Uh, great to see you. So anyway, this is the Irish Brigade now. We come down to a formation of around 30,000 men, the Irish Brigade, in this huge drama of the Italian campaign. And we've been following the Irish Brigade, you and I, together since it was first formed in '42. So um, what brought it uh, to uh, this position of Monte Castelloni in uh, March 1944? Well, in a sense, so uh, they were on the ground. They'd been moved across from the Central Highlands, Apennine Mountains, in the middle of February, in expectation of joining the advance of if the other attacks in February and March had been successful, they would have been able to be part of the breakthrough force into the Leary Valley. But obviously they were thwarted. The plans were put in place for the next final battle, as we now know, but the fourth battle at the time in May. And uh, the... 78th Division in Toto was brought into the Casino Massif. The Irish Brigade went up onto the peak of Castellone and onto Phantom Ridge. And one part was uh, the Brigade HQ was left in Cairo Village in the, 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 the lower valley area of, um, of Castellone. And uh, Cairo is, um, tell us about what Cairo was like at this time, uh, 80 years ago. I mean, I'm sure many places uh, got the moniker of being the heaviest, heaviest shelled town or place in Italy at this time, but Cairo was characterised as being heavily shelled. If you go to the area, it's about three or, uh, three or four miles north of Casino Town. Obviously, Casino Town was completely levelled in, in, um, in the middle of March of 44. Cairo, Cairo Village was a very important area and communication center for all the allied armies in that area so it's sort of on the foothills of monte cairo so there today and as was then the track up to the top of monte cairo would come through cairo village up to Tirele. so it's sort of on the north side eventually of the massif but cairo itself is very important also so it was the communication hub for all the supplies to be sent up to the top of monte Castellone. It was the start of um, the Cavendish Trail, Cavendish Road, which had been built ostensibly for tanks, a, you know, a very important or felt to be a very important advance in the middle of March, Cavendish Road. But, so Cairo was a very important hub, but heavily shelled because it, it was sort of over the other side of the mountain of Castellone, where if, if the shelling or artillery rounds were targeted from uh, Monte Cairo, other places on the north north side of the area, it would if it missed the peak of Castellone, it would come into the village of Cairo, and therefore that Cairo was a pretty dangerous place in April and well March and April of 1944. Yes, it's described by Pat Scott, the Brigadier Commander of the Irish Brigade, as that period as one of the most worst periods of his experience in the Irish Brigade, even though the casualties were quite modest in the 28 days where they were there. Um, you, you've done a little work on the casualties. Tell us a little bit about the numbers and the circumstances of what happened up there. They had sangers, so they 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 were vulnerable during the day, but there was continuous shelling and mortaring, wasn't there? Throughout, yes, that's right. I mean, we touched on it perhaps last time that when the um, the Irish Brigade took over Phantom Ridge and the peak of Castellone, um, we won't go into the geography in so much detail at this point, but they took over from the French Expeditionary Corps. You might have had it in that preliminary. Uh, section. Um, the the um, initially, the French said we don't patrol too much. You know, we don't do. We let the Germans sort of, in a sense, do what they like. But then we we clamp down every so often. But the Irish Brigade came into the position uh, at the end of our, March, as he said, from the twenty eighth of March onwards. So the skins of the first ones up there, the Royal Inniskilling Fusiliers, Sixth Battalion, Barla Breeden, who we know well, 
on various occasions during this narrative was the commanding officer and his his ethos and pat scott's was aggressive patrolling so they were going out front and, and in the first few days it was really the mines that had been sown by multi-nations so castelloni had been attacked previously in january february by the americans and the french taken over the french the germans sowed mines so the the mine mining area was was pretty grim so in the first few days many casualties from mines not just german mines but the people's own mines our own mines the allied mines was the end of March, there were four skins, and the the casualties continued throughout. Not very many over the period of the twenty eight days. About twenty five men from the Irish Brigade were killed, but a, a, a multiple of that were, were casualties. And as remarked by Dan Kelleher's um, citation for his military cross, Father Kelleher, that in that occasion, which was actually on Maundy Thursday, on the sixth of of uh, April, he went out front and without helmeted he went out and seemingly the citation suggested he actually saved the lives of two men in the war diaries six men were seriously injured but two men were were cited in dan's um dan Kelleher's uh, mc citation um and just going on from that period in middle of april you know successively on the day before easter saturday there were four sorry six skins were killed in they actually were, were bringing mule supplies up and in fact, in that occasion, with the six out of the two men, out of the six who were killed, there were two men who had been previously awarded the military medal, one at Chanteripe in August of 43, the famous occasion, a skin. So that was um, Robert Aplin. And the, uh, the, uh, another gentleman on that occasion who was killed on, the, on Easter Saturday was, was uh, Corporal Little, who was awarded the military medal at the Sangro River. So looking at the war diaries, there was a pitter patter excuse the expression so dailies of casualties mortar and artillery casualties deaths were occurring mostly with the skins a few london irish and then one even on the last day of their or the last few days of the uh of the patrolling of the mountainside of castellone before the poles took over there was um, a gentleman called john doris who was killed a london irishman was killed on the 24th of april and he was actually, interestingly, from our background of ancestry, was from Tralee in uh, County Kerry. So it, it just went on regularly, daily. It was it, it was a difficult period. So um, Father Kelleher, um, tell us a little about that. As I said, he was um, born in Ireland. He was actually ordained in Liverpool. And he um, the, the way that uh, 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 chaplains emerged, they volunteered. They volunteered, but um, he was very popular. But what happened to him in the end? I mean, he saw the war the war out, didn't he? Uh, and then what, he did. What yeah. Future? I mean, he was ostensibly the chaplain to the Royal Irish Fusiliers, first battalion, but became the Catholic chaplain for the brigade. So uh, Daniel Callagher, he joined the Irish Brigade in around December of forty three, became very uh, well known straight away, and obviously his deeds here at uh, at Cairo made him a very important figure in in the history of the irish brigade and of course then later show your you'll mention his remark about his his role in setting up the meetings with the pope in june of 44 but he went through to the end of the war with the irish brigade into austria uh, my father remarked several times on occasions how he 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 helped my father through with the guidance spiritual and 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 just general friendliness of getting him through all these occasions including St. Patrick's Day in 1945, which was not a, a wartime experience, but it was a, a, an adventure for the Irish Brigade in Fort Lee. But going beyond the war, he stayed in support of the armed forces. And very sadly, he was killed in a road accident in, in Berlin, actually, in, in the mid-1950s. So still a young man, still in his mid-50s at that point. Yeah, from... short of family in Ireland. We'd love to meet them. Uh, if they are, you know, people who are of his family network, tend to be rather large families in Ireland, uh, particularly got a priest in them. Anyway, so uh, in the mention, I just mentioned that uh, we had the um, uh, we had the story of John Wilton, who was a lieutenant in the Six Kings, and um, it, it's not really a coincidence that Six Kings were put the, out closest to the German lines, literally hundred yards, a couple hundred yards away from the, where the Germans were. About hundred, yeah. Yep, and that's because Barla Braden or Henry Braden uh, was appointed commanding officer of the Six Skins just before they were put into uh, into Castellone. 
And uh, he had aura, a, a tremendous reputation for being very aggressive. He's a regular, very aggressive, uh, pushy uh, battle uh, commander. And uh, before he went up to Castellone, he took his, uh, he went off with some of his offers for a party in Naples. And um, he, um, after having a drink, they nabbed uh, a carriage, you know, some of the horse drawn taxis. And then he had a chariot race through the streets of, streets of Naples. Uh, the commanding officer, his it, or the brigadier, did you know all, all threatened him that I was almost going to send you home, but it's too late now. But he knew what he was doing because he'd got a reputation. And then the uh, fusiliers heard about their new commanding officer as this kind of nutcase uh, who's prepared to do almost anything. And he was a he was a big laugh. So Butler Braden's uh, six skins were were given that forward position. He was very aggressive. He was patrolling all through the area, down towards Albanessa Farm, in fact, in the valley where the tank had been tanks had been knocked out. And the the, the, the war diaries the accounts suggest that he very successfully dominated the area and stopped the Germans patrolling. Indeed. Yeah, can I all... just can I just clarify something? It, it, it's H E N Breeden. He's actually Humphrey, not Henry. Oh, Humphrey Breeden. Yeah. Um, so John Wilton, whose story you can, it's several hours of recordings in the Imperial War Museum, and it's worth listening to. And John Wilton, who was uh, telling the story of the Lance Corporal, this Irish regular, who terrified everybody, including him, because that wasn't the only incident when this uh, this Lance Corporal um, kind of got a little bit out of hand, and he came along and he threatened the three centuries with the knife, which is not uh, King's regulations. Anyway, it was effective. Uh, John Wilton, um, as I mentioned, was an Oxford University uh, student. He was called up, found himself in the skins. Uh, later in uh, the Italian campaign, he became a captain and he was in the Royal Irish Fusiliers, the Fox, post-war. And I met him because he became a very distinguished um, uh, member of the British Foreign Office. And his final posting was as British ambassador to Saudi Arabia, in which capacity I met him. Rather remarkable. I did not know at the time he'd been in the Irish Brigade. Who would have thought it? Mm. So these connections go on and on. And of course, we know one of his sons, Robin. And I know two of his sons, actually. So the connections continue to this day. So um, they were pulled out. The um, And then the Poles came in. And I, I'm not sure what you're, you're feeling on this, because the account, you can see, that Pat Scott was asked by his commanding officer, that's the 78th Division Commander Keatley, hmm. who, I mean, he paraphrased it. There's not, he said that Keatley came to him and said, what is your suggestion, given you're on Castellone and given you're on Phantom Ridge? How he, would you suggest? You're so close. You're closer to the Abbey than anybody else, more or less. How do you suggest the Irish Brigade should capture the Abbey? And he says in his account, which is obviously written post-war, he said, I think I'd prefer someone else to do it that's my suggestion that someone else should do it. Now, I'm not sure that with, whether that was decisive or not, or whether, it, you know, Keatley came back and he, he fed it up the line and said, um, 78 Division or the uh, the Irish Brigade are not going to do this. It looks like a suicide mission. And they swapped out. So the Irish Brigade were taken off at the end of April. They're, only, they're up for a month, which is long enough, taken down to the valley. And then you brought, then the, um, the uh, second Polish Corps came up I don't know whether that was decisive because the the, the count is on the that the the first suggestion to General Anders, commanding the Second Polish Corps, that the Poles should capture Monte Cassino was made on the twenty fourth of March. So I don't know whether it's decisive or not. Whether Pat Scott's claiming it was decisive. No, I, I think you know uh, artistic license in the comment. I suppose I, I you know John Hardin, the the the, the senior. General who was devising diadem plan. Obviously, the, the as you remarked in previous broadcasts, I think that the polls did take really wanted involved, and, and it was decided at the end of March. You know, clearly during this period, I think it was the the specifics, the tactical specifics of how you would take the Abbey, and I suppose in that case, and and the seventy eighth division amongst others were were obviously earmarked in the middle of April or from from the period of the first plan or the first plan for the final battle to be the breakthrough for 78th Division, including the Irish Brigade. So I suppose, and, and to be clear, Pat Scott wrote that account down in 1944. So it was it was fairly um, contemporary. And, and well, his, then, by, and by, then his, he, by then he did know that the Polish casualties taking the Abbey were absolutely monumental. He had a yes, thousand. Indeed. Yeah. yeah. He wasn't 
being facetious, I think. It was, you know, just it was in the characteristic of of his accounts, which occasionally could be uh, quite amusing, as it were, talking about less military matters, you might say, on occasion. He, you know, he was trying to couch it. Whoever wrote it, I mean, it's clearly his his voice, but it was uh, the intelligence officer would have written the account, I think, um, of, yeah. of that period. So it, it, it was published, actually, in July 44. So anyway, that, that's an aside. But. Yeah, it's interesting because he, when you read these accounts, you're not sure to what extent it's an ex post rationalisation of what actually happened, which is one of the reasons why uh, Laurie Franklin Vale's account from a captain I mean, it's real time. He's writing what he actually feels at that time. And he does make observations about the tactical situation in Italy. And that continues. So, look, Richard, thank you very much uh, for this. Um, just to a, a quick update, um, the tour that you're leading, we're leading to Italy on the 11th and 19th, is going ahead very well, isn't it? Um, yeah, the we, plans for that. Yeah, we, we are actually, and we're not, we're planning to be present, we hope to be present at the German War Cemetery on the 15th of May, do not, Richard. And that's actually in Cairo, so as we've mentioned, the village of Cairo, just out in the outskirts with a geographically a stupendous view of Monte Castelloni, as you've got to say, um, looking up, and the 15th morning, we're, we're hoping to, to join that commemoration, and hopefully a couple of our Irish pipers will be able to play appropriate laments or, or other appropriate music uh, as as VIPs are, are joining the ceremony in the morning of the 15th of of May. Yes, absolutely. Well, um, I'm suggesting people come to our conference on the 31st of May and the 1st of June. Very good lineup, 40 speakers, very good venues. Everything is going very well. And uh, anyway, Richard, thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to uh, take off screen. Don't go away. Anyway, that's it uh, for this week. Uh, we'll be back next week with another episode. Next time, we're going to be looking at the French Expeditionary Corps, who they were, how did they get to Casino, and uh, the post-war implications. It's a fascinating story. So until then, from everybody here at uh, This Week in the Telling Campaign, it's goodbye, God bless, and uh, look after yourselves. Happy Easter.